Well, good morning, Redmond Grace Brethren Church. It's good to be here with you. My name's Clark, and I'm the pastor here. And if we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, I'd love to meet you and your family after service. Uh, we are going to continue in our sermon series that we have been in on the Sermon on the Mount. So we're excited to continue that here this morning. If you missed any of the past week messages, I encourage you, you can always go to our website at rittmangrace.org, and you can access all those past week messages that you might have missed. Uh, but we're going to continue in that today. Uh, today's kind of a special day. I'm not going to be preaching this morning. We have a guest uh, speaker here today. His name is Phil Bryant. Uh, many of you know him. Uh, if you uh, haven't known him as long, like if you're like me and you haven't known him that long, uh, this is a great opportunity for you as well. Uh, Phil is somebody that our church has actually supported for over 25 years now. And if you were here during our 9.30 uh, Sunday school hour, he was able to share a lot of those details and kind of do a, a deeper dive with what uh, kind of ministry God has called him to. And uh, so if you don't get a chance to meet Phil afterwards, um, I encourage you to uh, maybe check out that table of resources that he has. Uh, but I would encourage you to, you know, he's a real approachable guy, come up and ask him questions, you know, like, what kind of ministry he's doing. He has a real heart uh, for Canada. He's going to tell you a little bit about that, perhaps, during his message today. But uh, without further ado, let's give a warm Rittman Grace welcome to Phil Bryant. All right. All right. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it very much. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's Rippin' Grace doing? How's Rippin' Grace doing? That is great. I can hear them through the microphones. They're actually all the way back from their te television sets. I can hear them. They're saying... They're doing great. Well, all of us probably had quite a nightmare waking up yesterday morning. How about that? Yeah, I was, had so much I wanted to do, and I turned on my television, or not my television, my, my screen, and uh, started to look at the news like I probably shouldn't but always do, and all of a sudden, there's a lot of tragedy, wasn't it? That was pretty hard. And the first thing I thought was, okay, I'm sending out a post saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, <laughs> right? And um, boy, a lot of loss, a lot of death, uh, a, lot of, a lot of loss. And sadly, uh, no matter what anyone thinks about it or where they're at, there's more death coming. And so war is. War is not good. How many of us are ready for the Prince of Peace to come and split that mountain of olives apart and uh, reign? How many would like him to reign even today? That would be great. We're good with that. Um, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. We live in a broken world, and we are part of it. Um, and so I want to take a second to pray for Israel before we start the message this morning, and then we'll kind of lead into the, what's happening with us. Father, you saw every last part of what did and didn't happen, and you saw all the people that were hurt, and the families that were hurt, and the people that were captured, and you know how they're being treated even now as we speak. You know all of the, the schemes of the enemies. You know what their plans are. And um, so I just pray, Father, that you would give peace uh, to your people, Israel. And I pray that you'd give people, peace to your people who trust in you and know you by name and, and uh, call you Lord. Father, I pray that you show yourself mighty in some crazy way that we can't even understand right now to demonstrate your glory and bring others to you. Father, we just pray that you would rescue souls of men. And um, we ask uh, for us as the church to respond in a way that honors you, to respond in a way that lets you be the judge and demonstrates your grace. Help us, Lord, to be um, those who can bring others to you because of who you are, even in tragedy. So I pray for this. I pray for your grace in your name. Amen. Wow. Well, now we won't be able to think about the message all morning long because some crazy guy introduced what we've all been thinking about for the last two days. But this is my family. Well, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that's them. And uh, the most important people in my family aren't there because they're my grandkids, and they're not in the picture. So how many of you would agree with that kind of sentiment? Like that's, you know... Now, I know, and I know that most of you who, um, who are grandparents wouldn't treat us like my, my in-laws did, but, you know, it was snowing. We were living in Toronto. Her parents were living in Washington, D.C., just outside of Baltimore, 
And uh, we, we drove what would normally be a 10 and a half hour drive. It took us about 14 hours through the snow to get there. And as we drove up into the driveway, the grandparents came out of the house and they ran right past the front doors to the back sliding doors of the van and greeted the grandchildren. We thought, we are a good taxi cab service to bring these grandkids here. But no, grandkids are important to my, my daughter, Lydia, just had her third uh, her little boy named Charlie just a couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago. And, um, and so we're so excited about that. My wife, Beth, was able to go down and see, see them, and they live in Northern California. And uh, so she's missing for the picture. But uh, this is my family. We are thankful that for your church and your kindness to us, supporting us and being uh, prayerful for us. We beg you to pray for what God is doing in our family. Pray for what God is doing in Canada, and pray for what God is doing and assist. There's lots going on in all of those arenas. Inside of your bulletins this morning is a little insert which lets you fill out a piece of paper so that I can blanket you with all kinds of email begging you to buy the next gadget. No, actually, I send out a monthly newsletter. That's it. Sometimes it's every six weeks, so you'll only get bugged by me a little bit. Okay, so, but I tell you what's going on in Canada and what's happening in our family's lives. If you want to pray for us, I would encourage you to fill that out and just leave that with us. I have some stuff in the back if you guys want. Uh, frisbees for the kids, luggage tags for those who like to travel, and other things back there that you guys can check out. But... As you, uh, as you know, we're in this series called Sermon on the Mount, and it's a great series. I really love it. I, I was looking at the, the message point. I love that you guys are organized around here. Like, you have these booklets that you can go take notes on and go back and think through stuff. I went back and looked at everything. I was like, man, I, I, can't, keep, I can't compete with this Clark guy. He's, he's, way, he's way ahead of me. And, uh, and so that's really great. It's good. And isn't it neat that you have something that you can actually take a record of and kind of I really enjoy that. I think that's a really great way to go, and I'm really glad you guys are doing that. That's super great. And this Sermon on the Mount, I mean, the hard part about any of this text is that, how many of you know that Jesus knows more than we do? I'm not even saying that facetiously. I'm just saying that as I was preparing for this message. I'm like, he knows so much more than we do. And uh, trying to get my head around what he's saying here, um, we're going we're gonna to bump into this, but there's literally we could spend months on this particular text I think it is the gateway into the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. I think it hankers, it hinges on a lot of the thinking that Jesus has related to what's, how he's talking about doing life and what life is all about. And Jesus is going to engage that whole concept and why he came. All of that's kind of right here in this text. And so this morning, you can read with me. I'm going to hear in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. I've got the NIV. And it says this. Do not think that I have come, this is Jesus speaking, to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. See here, I want to make sure that uh, my text is the same as that text. There we go, verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be great, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, this is a lot to think about. Jesus, of course, he's speaking at the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to all of these Jewish people who have a Jewish heritage, who've been schooled and taught by the law. They go to the temple. They hear the rabbi or the, the Levites teach them, and they go to the priest to do their sacrifices. They understand the heritage of all the different laws that have been given back in the Torah, back in the, both the, um, the books of the law and the books of the writings, and they know all of these truths. And then, on top of that, they have all these traditions that the elders have decided are important to hold on to. And, and so when Jesus says some incredible stuff in this text, he's like, uh, you know, he's being falsely accused by, by, the, uh, by the Jewish people that he's not holding on to this, and Jesus is going to push back really hard. And he's going to challenge us to think about some stuff this morning. So kind of put your seatbelts on um, and get the thinking 
things going on, make some notes, I guess, because I'm going to say some things that are going to be questionable, and then Clark's going to have to clean up the mess once I'm done. So you guys will be good. So, all right, so here you think about, there, is, there are a bunch of big ideas that Jesus is saying. I think, you know, Jesus makes some very strong assertions in this text. And just, you don't have to look very hard to find them. Right away, you see that he says, I did not come to abolish the law, right? That's what he said. If you read the, do, do not think I've come to abolish the law. <laughs> so I, he didn't come to do that, okay? That's interesting. He says he came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill the law. And not the least bit will it disappear till it, it's all been fulfilled. So the law isn't going to go away until it's all fulfilled. Whether a little jot or a tittle, these are little parts of the Hebrew um, letters that were there. And they were, you know, he's saying these aren't even going to go away until they're all fulfilled. So don't set aside what I'm about to teach you about the law, or you'll be, you're going to pay eternally. Don't minimize what I'm going to tell you. And you guys are getting ready for entering into the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is going to say things like, you have heard it said, but I tell you. You have heard it said, but I tell you. Jesus is getting ready to say that the law is different than you think it is. <laughs> Very different. And he says right in this text something really, really profound. We're not going to focus on it this morning, but I want you to make a note. I want you to make a note and think about it going forward as Clark continues to teach you from the Word of God these things that Jesus is saying. Look what he says. He says this interesting thing. He says, therefore, anyone who sets aside, anyone who sets aside one of the, the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What are these commands? Well, he's going to get ready to tell you them. He's setting the stage for the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about don't set aside the things I'm getting ready to tell you. He's telling the listener, what I'm telling you is going to be important, not just for today, but if you want to be great in heaven, if you want to have a good time in heaven, if that's your eternal dwelling is something you really want to have a really high standing in, well, you better pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say. So just make a big note of that. This is something that Jesus is telling the audience here that he's going to spend this large sermon on, and he's telling them, yeah, pay attention to what, this, what these commands are. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, how many good people are in the room this morning? How many okay people are in the room this morning? How many people are really good at sinning in this room this morning? Three of you are honest, the rest of you are a bunch of liars. We are all good at sitting, right? In fact, it comes naturally, doesn't it? We're really good at sitting. And when, when Jesus is speaking now to these Jewish people who've grown up in Jewish customs and Jewish heritage and have all kinds of Jewish practices and, and have tried to obey the law and give their sacrifices and do the right thing and go to this, obey the Sabbath and do all these cool things, and Jesus says, Unless you even do better than the teachers and the Pharisees who are teaching you this stuff, you can't even think about getting into heaven. Is that like an inspirational message or what? How many think that that meant people feel like they could really do this thing? But Jesus is really pushing on them. He's making some very, very, very strong statements. So about the law. What, is, I mean, what kind of laws are there in the Old Testament? There's ceremonial laws. These are like things that you do for special customs, like feast, festivals, um, keeping the Sabbath. These are all kind of ceremonial laws. There are laws that are a response you know, to, a, to things that we do as a customs. Then there's civil laws. These are really sometimes very technical. My son right now is reading, we've we, we challenged each other, the boys and I are challenging each other to um, 
no, no screen time until we've had God time. So we're going to read the Bible before we look at any of our screens. Okay? Used to be before breakfast, but now you know, screens even come before breakfast nowadays. So we just get, let's go to the screen. No, no screen time until we've read the Word of God and let it kind of saturate our heart. So my son's trying to read through the Bible this year. So he's going through the book of Leviticus. And he's like, Dad, every, son, every morning we have breakfast and we're talking about what we're learning. He's like, Dad, like, this is what you do with mold. You have to do this stuff when you have mold. You've got you to have the priest come look at it. And then you, he's telling me all these things. Oh, and this is what you do with your, with your donkey. Or this is what, I mean, he's, he, all of these unique things you have to, these are civil laws that were written in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. There's all these different rules and laws you have to obey as Jewish people. And they were how to do daily life. And then there are moral laws. Laws like, do not kill. How many of you are glad that that's a law? Okay, do not kill. Okay, that's something I'm glad people shouldn't do. And we see right now why the whole world is even at, up, up at odds. Even countries that we didn't think were going to back Israel are like, that's not cool. Like, don't do that. Like, you, you know, you can't, you crossed a red line here. So, moral laws. There are moral laws that God wrote in his word. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Not covet another man's wife. These are things that God tells us not to. These are moral laws. And so these are all the laws that, that, that are in the Old Testament that, that, that are there. But yet, you know, um, the Jews added even more to it. They had their, can you just, everyone kind of just, you know, I'm the missionary, you can just appease me for the day, right? You can speak back, you can talk loud in the service, you can put your hands up, you can even wave, you can do stuff, okay? You can do, do like this, ready? Traditions, ready? Traditions, okay? So they had their traditions, right? And so they would add to the law. They would make the law even harder. So Jesus, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, keep the Sabbath for it's holy, and because God rested on the seventh day, you should rest. And so now there are 541 commands of how to obey the Sabbath. And you can't walk more than a mile and a half, and you can't, you can't help anybody who's sick if they're dying, you can actually, you know, put a tourniquet on their bleeding arm, but you're not actually supposed to give them any medicine. You can't put any oil or anything to help them until after the Sabbath. You can't make your food. You can't, you can't work on the Sabbath. In fact, there's so many rules about what you can't do, all these traditions of the elders. And we see that um, the Jews would get all kinds of whacked out about this. If you look in Matthew chapter 15, <clears throat> you would see this whole interplay between Jesus and and the Pharisees, and they're all mad at Jesus' disciples because they're not obeying the laws. They're not keeping the laws that, that the Israelites are, or the Jews are supposed to follow. So then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and this here is in, in Matthew 15, verse 1, and, and asked, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And actually, it wasn't just washing their hands. They didn't ceremonially wash them the way the tradition of the elders was, a certain amount of water, and a certain way you do it, and a certain system. And the whole process of this, this is a whole thing. But they don't wash their hands before they eat because they are walking through a cornfield and they grab some corn and they eat it directly from their hands. <gasps> None of you have ever eaten fruit right out of your garden without washing your hands? And you don't own a garden. If you, if you haven't done that, you don't own a garden. Because if you own a garden, you've done that many times. In fact, my mother was always wondering where her vegetables were because her little boys were in the back eating the peas off the pods. And they were, yeah, you remember those. So, but, so in Jesus says this in verse 3. He says, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? They were so clever about their rules and their traditions that, ready, they're, traditions that they made to make themselves look good before God, that they actually used their traditions as leverage so they wouldn't have to obey God. Right? And if you go back and read now Matthew 15, you'll discover what Jesus is talking about, how they would make holy their money and set it aside for God so they wouldn't have to actually take care of their parents. And their, and their, and their, and it was just crazy. And Jesus is like, you guys, are, you guys are nuts. You guys have your own rules. But that's not what God's rules are. See, legalism is obeying rules to be accepted. Supposedly by God, but often by man. So we make up a bunch of rules. I grew up in a very legalistic environment. I grew up an independent Baptist, and I'm not against them. I, I love the teaching of the Word of God. But we, we had lots of rules. 
You know, girls couldn't wear pants. You couldn't do all kinds of things. There were lots of rules that we couldn't do certain things. And none of them were from the Bible. Some of them were good ideas, necessarily, but they weren't laws, but they became laws, right? Anyone ever had those kind of things in your church's background you grew up in? A little bit of those laws, you know, these, tra ready? Traditions of the elders, okay? And, and so here it is, that not only do you have all of the Old Testament laws, like do not lie and do not steal and do not cheat and do not covet, which all of us have broken. True? So we have the, the big ones, the moral laws. We've broken those. Then you have all these civil laws, which I am certain I've broken all kinds of those. I probably haven't brought my donkey the right distance or whatever. And I'm, I'm certain. And then you, have, then you have these ceremonial laws. And now you have the traditions of the elders. And they're like massive amount of rules that are on top of our heads. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. Look what James tells us in James chapter 2. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, can you read this with me out loud, is guilty of breaking all of it. Now that's a problem. That is a really big problem. I can't imagine the people sitting here, we all came to watch this miracle guy come and heal somebody and Maybe he's going to raise someone from the dead, or he's going to give us a bunch of free fish or something. And they're all on this mountain wanting to hear what this person, this prophet of God was going to say to them. And he stands up and says, you guys all know that I didn't come here actually to make it easier for you and to get rid of all the rules that you have and the laws that you have. In fact, I came to make sure we follow all of them to the very jot and tittle, and none of them are going to go away until they're completely fulfilled. In fact, if you don't do them, if you don't listening to the laws I'm talking about, you're going to be least in the kingdom of God. You're going to be less in heaven. In fact, if you can't follow these laws better than the religious leaders you have in your life, you're not going to even make it to heaven. Yay, I want to be in that sermon, right? When can I hear that message? That must have been really hard to take. I think that must have been really hard to take. I think people were going, uh, uh, oh, what do I do? This is a guy who is doing things differently, who really clearly must be connected to God because he's doing God stuff like healing people and casting out demons and and he's raising the dead, he's doing incredible stuff, and he must be from God, and he just told me that I, I'll never get to heaven, because I can't be even better than the Pharisees. I mean, they, they tithe on their lint coming off their clothing. Like, I don't even know, I don't know how I can be better than those guys. I'll never make it. I'll never make it. And that right there is the point. What we do with the law, Jesus said, it won't pass away until it is accomplished. And see, so we find in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul tells us, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, don't do the thing, don't eat the cookie. What, what cookie? <laughs> Did you say there's a cookie? Why did you tell me there's a cookie? Now you tell me there's a cookie. I want, how many want the cookie now? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he does. I know he wants the cookie. We want the cookie, right? Because I, I was just told I couldn't have the thing. And now all the thing, the thing becomes the only thing I can think about. Well, why didn't you let me have the thing? I want to go do the thing. So Paul says, and once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, can you say this with me? Sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought, say it with me, Death. For sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. What the banana juice is going on around here? All these laws and commandments and, and what they're doing, and, and, I, and I just when I find out I'm not supposed to do something, then I, now I really want to do it. Now I'm actually doing the wrong thing, and I'm doing the wrong thing more and more. And I'm really good at doing the wrong thing, and I can't do the right thing, and I'm caught in this circle of wanting to do the right thing, but I can't because I'm doing the wrong thing. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Ever been there? But felt guilty? Felt like helpless and can't get out of the cycle of not doing the wrong thing? 
and knowing it's the wrong thing and still doing the wrong thing? This isn't just my problem, not even your problem. It's, ready? Let's go like this. It's our problem. <laughs> this is a humankind problem. Paul is writing about it. Jesus is trying to get at it, and he's going at it from a different way. He's using what we call a Hebraism. It's called a goad. And a goad was designed to drive into the back of an ox so it would move, <laughs> so the donkey would get going. It didn't feel very good. In fact, it hurt, but it got it moving. And most of us, if we're, if we're honest about life and about our spiritual journeys, we are in patterns and routines, and we, we're not trying to be unteachable, we're not trying to be unwilling to learn, but we are used to hearing what we're used to hearing, we already have our mindset of most of the stuff we're gonna hear, and we're not really thinking about it, and Jesus is just basically body slamming everybody in the same moment and saying, wake up, you can't do this. The law will not save you. You cannot do it. You are unable to do it. None of you will be able to do this. And so now the response is what it should be, which is, oh, what do I do? I can't. And that's actually, that's the idea. I have the traditions, legalism I can't keep. I have the law bringing death to me, and I can't keep it. It shows me my sin. We find this wrestling, and Paul has this wrestling, Right? And if you have the opportunity, many of you have already done this many times, but I would encourage you, if you wrestle with sin, then wrestle with Paul, because Paul takes two full, long chapters, Romans 6 and 7, and he wrestles with sin, out loud. You would get to hear his thoughts. Because it's, it's a human condition. It's human condition, and if you find... You find yourselves, dear, finally at the end of Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Look what Paul says, what a wretched man I am. I don't think that's an ex a large enough explanation point. I think he was screaming that. Because most of his letters were, were written by, he spoke them and someone wrote them. He's probably screaming this at the poor narrator who's trying to write this down. Oh, what a wretched man I am, he says. I am worthless. I can't do this thing. I only, I'm only good at sinning. I keep on not doing the right thing. Oh, what a wretched man I am. He says, and look what he says. Who, can you read this with me? Who will rescue me together? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death together? Who will rescue, come on you guys. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? That's the question that Jesus was trying to raise. That's the thought he wanted to get them to come to. What am I going to do? And look at the answer Paul gives. Ready? Can we say it together? Verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. I think the point is, we can't. <laughs> How many of us are willing to admit that we can't keep the law? I can't even keep the moral law. Forget the civil law. Forget the, ready? Traditions. And yet Jesus is calling us, and he's telling us the law is still good, and it needs to be fulfilled. So what are we going to do? Well, we could preach for about till 2 o'clock this afternoon, and most of you would have already left, so I'm just going to try to hurry this up and finish up this morning on these thoughts that come out of the text. First is, Jesus fulfilled the law. Can I hear an amen? Two of you are happy about that. Ready? Guys, you're bound to hell if you don't fulfill the law. Ready? Jesus fulfilled the law. Okay, that's a little better. That's right. Amen. Jesus fulfilled the law. I don't have to. He did. Look what he said in Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Praise God. We don't have a narcissistic God that doesn't care. We don't have 
some kind of capricious God that just decides whimsically what to do. We don't have a deistic God that just left us all alone in this world and our brokenness. We have a God who came to us in person, in the flesh. He came down and became a man so that he could be with us and he could feel like us and he could hear like us and feel the pain that we feel and be a part of what we're dealing with. And he came to be with us. This is the God that we love. Amen? This is the one that we serve. This is the one that we follow. This is the reason why we give our lives, because he gave his life. Amen? Amen. And this is why we are followers of Jesus Christ, because he didn't sit on high with all of his power telling us what to do. He came down and became a man. And it says here in Hebrews, it says, we do not have a high priest unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. And I want you to say this out loud with me, ready? Just as we are, ready? Yet he did not, he did not, he did not sin. Fulfilled the law. All of it. The moral, ceremonial, Civil, not the traditions of the elders. All of God's law. He fulfilled it. It's really important that we get a hold of that. Later we see Jesus talking to them in John chapter 8, verse 46. He says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Now, um, Elmo, you've been here a few days, this church, about two or three thousand. Um, and, and you're a really good guy. Every time I met you, you smile, you're kind, you're generous, you're nice. But I bet you, if I was to say, can anybody prove Elmer wrong of sin, someone could find some kind of dirt on Elmer. I didn't say made-up stuff. (laughs) And it's not because he's a terrible human. It's because he is a human. And as nice as a guy as he is, he still has sin. My point is this. Jesus was getting ready to be stoned by the Jews who were trying to find a way to kill him. And he says to them, can you just bring one? All of you, thousands of you who've known me, come and bring one thing I've done wrong. Boy, I couldn't last a second. I've got five kids and a wife. They know all kinds of stuff that I've done wrong. Jesus says, just bring one thing. Could they bring it? No, because he was without sin. He never sinned. Look what Colossians tells us. Well, just before we go to Colossians, I wanted to say this to you. You know, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law. He fulfilled the civil law and he fulfilled the moral law. Think about the ceremonial law for a second. Just, we could stay, I mean, this part of the text, we could, we could, we could literally preach 10 sermons on this part alone. I can't. But just, just to give you a little, a little dip into the water, do you think it was an accident that Jesus was crucified on the Passover? Or how many think that might have been on purpose? How many think that might have fulfilled a few things, like the laws? And how many of those other things that he did continue to do just that? Just dipping a little drop in the water help you understand that Jesus fulfilled all the law. He fulfilled it. And his moral codes, civil codes, and and the ceremonial things, he fulfilled all of those things. And look what he says in Colossians now, chapter 2. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by the way you eat or drink or regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath day. Point here is verse 17. Can you read it with me? These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, together nice and loud, is found in Christ. Guys, this verse, Paul is telling us, Christ fulfilled all of those festivals and all the things that were talked about and why they were even existing. He is the Passover lamb, amen? 
He fulfilled all of those types of things. And we can go on to hundreds of those illustrations, but I'm just using that as a key one because it's clear. I'm just saying it, he fulfilled those things and he has fulfilled those laws. The second reason he's fulfilled the law is Jesus paid the debt. You know this, don't you? We find ourselves in Galatians chapter, I'll just read this to you, it's not here, sorry. Galatians 3, verse 13, Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. We find ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, he says this, God made him who had no sin, ready to be sin for us, so that in him, Ready? We might become the, come on, we might become the, the ones who are right. The ones who have fulfilled the law. We might become those who are declared right before God. We are going to become right before God because I fulfilled all the laws myself and did it all by myself and I did it my way, me and Frankie. No. Because I could not. I was unable. I was broken. I was not able to fulfill the law, and I was bound to judgment forever, and I deserved all of it. But God sent his son, Jesus, and he came and he fulfilled all of the law. He was perfect. He fulfilled the laws and the Sabbath and all the things that were present in that. And there's so much to talk about there. And then he also then replaced it. He covered it. He paid for it. He took the penalty I deserved on himself. And because he didn't have a penalty to give, there was no penalty for him. He can take that penalty. And so it says in Romans chapter 8, just read along with me. It's a couple of verses here, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Where? For those who are in Christ Jesus. Dear friend, if you've been wrestling with sin and guilt and shame, if you're feeling unable to meet the requirements both of God and the traditions of of Ritman grace, or what you think the unspoken codes are here. What you need is to surrender not to Ritman grace or to other things in your head, but you need to place your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who's fulfilled all the law. and He's the one who paid the penalty that you could not pay. So we place our faith in him because we desperately need him. We need his grace. We need his mercy. We need his love. And we need, and if I want to become righteous, I can't virtue signal with my sign or my bow or my colors or whatever the thing is. I actually have to be righteous. And the only way I can become righteous is by getting righteousness that's not from me, but from God. From him. And he says now, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, whoops, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this leads us to the last point this morning is this. This righteousness is received, ready, by faith. I can't earn it. I can't fulfill it. I can't do it. I don't have the ability to do this. And God knows that. And that's why he sent his son. And that's why he did. Look what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3. He says... What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. We don't really grab this, but Paul was a wealthy 
well-educated, sophisticated person in his culture. And by the time he's writing this letter in prison after being beaten with 39 lashes, one less of life, several times, shipwrecked, after having many other challenges in his life, Paul writes, after starting churches all across Asia and Asia Minor, he writes, I count all of that as rubbish, all of my achievements as nothing, and everything I compare, comparing to the surpassing greatness of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that ready, verse, just before verse 9, that I may gain Christ, and ready, and be found in him, read this with me please, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith. Dear friend, Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scholars and the godly people you know in your life and the religious people in your life, unless it's greater than those people, you are not going to heaven. If you're watching online and maybe you're just checking in, I just want to encourage you. This is not a negative message. This is a real reality message because the good news is that I can't, but he can. Amen? I couldn't, and he did. The answer is Jesus fulfilled the law. He was righteous, fully righteous in every way. And because of his righteousness and because of his death, I can appropriate his righteousness for myself. Not because I'm better, not because I'm smarter, but because I submit myself to recognize I can't and he can. And I place my faith in Jesus Christ. And when I do, I place my faith in him and he gives me his righteousness. Now I can be more righteous than the Pharisees. Not by myself, but by the righteousness that comes in Christ. My question for you this morning Whose righteousness are you standing on? It's what Jesus is pushing on. He says his law is not going to pass away. I'm not happy with people telling people not to follow my law. Follow me. And then he's going to describe what his laws are over the next couple of months. You guys are going to be going through some of those. You've heard it said, but I say to you. He's going to tell you what he thinks and how to follow him. But don't miss the big point. We're following him because not only does he know the way, he is the way. And when I place my faith in Christ, now I can be forgiven. Now I can be declared righteous. Now I can be with him forever. Now I can have that relationship with him. And the Apostle Paul said, I count everything else but rubbish except for knowing Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for the incredible ministry that has been done here and around the world because of the faithfulness of your people, their giving, their prayer, their shepherding, their mentoring, their coaching, their developing leaders right here. But Lord, I'm not lost in the fact that we can be good people to the outside world, but Jesus was trying to make it clear that none of us are good enough to match God. So we need surrender. We need to raise our white flag and say we can't. We need to acknowledge that our sin is worthy of death and that we can't pay the price. And Father, we thank you that you sent your son who did, who lived it, who was it, who fulfilled it, and then died so that we don't have to. Lord, today, may we place our faith in Jesus and may we follow his laws the way to life. I pray in your name. Amen.